Okay, and now we're going to look at async keyboard input. Our simple executor does not utilize the waker notifications and simply loops over all tasks until they are done. This wasn't a problem for our example, since our example task can directly run to finish on the first poll call. To see the performance advantages of a proper waker implementation, we first need to create a task that is truly asynchronous, i.e. a task that will probably return poll pending on the first poll call. We already have some kind of asynchronicity in our system that we can use for this, hardware interrupts. As we learned from in the interrupts post, hardware interrupts can occur at arbitrary points in time determined by some external device. For example, a hardware timer sends an interrupt to the CPU after some predefined time elapsed. When the CPU returns an interrupt, receives an interrupt, it immediately transfers control to the corresponding handler function defined in the interrupt descriptor table. And now I'm getting an interrupt by a local freight train. Okay. In the following, we will create an asynchronous task based on the keyboard interrupt. The keyboard interrupt is a good candidate for this because it is both non-deterministic and latency critical. Non-deterministic means that there is no way to predict when the next key press will occur because it's entirely dependent on the user. Latency critical means that we want to handle the keyboard input in a timely manner, otherwise the user will feel a lag. To support such a task in an efficient way, it will be essential that the executor has proper support for waker notifications. Epic Vlog says, really curious how the waker is able to trigger from the interrupt handler. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I mean, if I were to do it, and just, I haven't looked ahead, but it would, it would be involve a mutex. You would, we'd grab a mutex, we'd um, set a flag somewhere uh, that would cause it to execute on the next time a task runs, and then, right, and then release the mutex, and then in the poll, we would do the opposite um, to look at what's going on. But let's see what they do. Uh, scan code Q. Currently, we handle the keyboard input directly in the input interrupt handler. This is not a good idea for the long term because interrupt handlers should stay as short as possible as they might interrupt important work. Instead, interrupt handlers should only perform the minimal amount of work necessary, e.g. reading the keyboard scan code, and leave the rest of the work, e.g. interpreting the scan code, to a background task. A common pattern to our keyboard interrupt. This means that the interrupt handler only reads the scan code from the keyboard, pushes it to the queue, and then returns. The keyboard task sits on the other end of the queue and interprets and handles each scan code that is pushed to it. A simple implementation of that queue could be a mutex protected vec deck. However, using mutexes in interrupt handlers is not a good idea. Yep, that's true, since it can easily lead to deadlocks. For example, when the user presses a key while the keyboard task has locked the queue, the interrupt handler tries to acquire the lock again and hangs indefinitely. Another problem with this approach is that the VEC deck automatically increases its capacity by performing new heap allocation when it becomes full. This can lead to deadlocks again because our allocator also uses a mutex internally. Further problems that are further problems are heap. Further problems are that heap allocations can fail or take a considerable amount of time when the heap is fragmented. Whitford Small says, I'd assume that it has a global registry with interrupts and their associated wakers. Uh, that's, that's, yeah, that sounds reasonable. Let's see what we do here. To prevent these problems, we need a queue implementation that does not require mutexes or allocations for its push operation. Such queues can be implemented by using lock-free atomic operations for pushing and popping elements. This way, it is possible to create push and pop operations that only require a self-reference and are thus usable without a mutex. To avoid allocations on push, the queue can be backed by a pre-allocated fixed size buffer. While this makes the queue bounded, i.e. has a maximum length, it's often possible to define reasonable upper bounds for the queue length in practice so that this isn't a big problem. The crossbeam crate. 
Implementing such a queue in a correct and efficient way is very difficult, so I recommend to stick to existing well-tested implementations. One popular Rust project that implements various mutex-free types for concurrent programming is Crossbeam. It provides a type named ArrayQueue that is exactly what we need in this case, and we're lucky the type is fully compatible to no standard crates with allocation support. To use the type, we need to add a dependency on the Crossbeam queue crate. So why are we doing it this way instead of a single line? Let's try it as a single line. If that breaks, then we can fix it. Two one features. Like that. That looks right. By default, the crate depends on the standard library. To make it no standard compatible, we need to disable its default features and instead enable the alloc feature. Note that depending on the main crossbeam crate does not work here because it's missing an export of the queue module for no standard. I filed a pull request to fix this, but it wasn't released on crates IO yet. Oh, this was written back in March of 2020. So maybe this happened. Yes. So this looks like it, um, it's been fixed. Canceled. Oh, Travis Phil. Okay. It looks like there's no good solution for this at the moment. Okay, Travis is finally green. Okay, so we got the fix. Build succeeded. Thanks for merging this. Um, so I imagine that this is ready now. Uh, I don't know if that would mean we can just say cross beam. I misspelled version. A big blog says there is no difference. It's just that some developers split into a different section if the line gets too long. Oh, you mean between this, this line here and this? Yeah. My line's not too long yet, so I'm going to stick with this just to keep things consistent. Thank you, Epic. All right, queue implementation. Using the array queue type, we can now create a global scan code queue in a new task keyboard module. Okay, so we're gonna create this. We currently have, oh, maybe it's an interrupt. So where are we doing the keyboard? This is the timer interrupt, and here's the keyboard interrupt handler. Okay. Yep. So this is this is our current keyboard handler. So we're going to just create a brand new keyboard handler. Okay. Source task. Oh, we already have source task. Source task mod. You say pub mod keyboard. And when we try to build it. I said when we try, oh, it's building the crossbeam thing. All right, let's just hang out for a minute while it's building crossbeam. That's taking a long time. Glitch, but small says crossbeam Q already has version 036 published. Probably has the fix mentioned included. Okay. Yeah, we can try that after we get everything working. We can go back and take a look. All right, so we're going to create this file now. Uh, use conquer once, spin once cell. What the heck is conquer once? Cross beam Q, ray Q. A once cell of U8s. Since the array queue new performs heap allocation, which is not possible at compile time yet, we can't initialize a static variable directly. Instead, we use the once cell type of the conquer once crate, which makes it possible to 
to perform safe one-time initialization of static values. To include the crate, we need to add it to our dependency. Okay. So let's add that as well. I don't know why they, we didn't do that up above. Conquer once. To O. All features is false. Okay. And what I'm going to do now is going to do a cargo check out here. Oops. I forgot the equal sign, didn't I? There we go. Nope. I still got that messed up. That's another reason to do it on separate lines, right? Because you can't forget the closing brace. What's going on? Oh, I see. There we go. Now, fifth time's the charm. Okay, so we have dead code, but that's fine. It's building now. Instead of the once cell primitive, we could use the lazy static macro here. However, the once cell type has the advantage that we can ensure that the initialization does not happen in the interrupt handler thus preventing that the interrupt handler performs a heap allocation. Okay, that makes sense. Filling the queue. To fill the scan code queue, we create a new add scan code function that we will call from the interrupt handler. Okay, so in here we're gonna use create println and then called by a keyboard interrupt handler must not block or allocate. Okay, I can add that comment. Doesn't need to be three, right? Okay, pub crate. U8. If let, okay, Q is equal to scan code Q, try get. If let error, Q push, scan code. Okay, so this line here means that if we can't get the scan code Q, we're just gonna drop the key on the floor. Um, and println warning, scan code Q full, dropping keyboard input, else println. This is also dangerous, right? Writing stuff, because we're in interrupt context now. Right? We're in interrupt context now, and now we're writing stuff to the screen, which also grabs mutexes and stuff. So how does he explain that? We use the once cell try get to get a reference to the initialized queue. If the queue is not initialized yet, we ignore the keyboard scan code and print a warning. It's important that we don't try to initialize the queue in this function because it will be called by the interrupt handler, which should not perform heap allocations. Since this function should not be callable from our main.rs, we use the pub create visibility to make it only available to our libRS. In the fact that the array queue push method requires only a self-reference makes it a very simple makes it very simple to call the method on a static queue. The array queue type performs all necessary synchronization itself, so we don't need a mutex wrapper here. In case the queue is full, we print a warning too. To call the add scan code function on our keyboard interrupts, we update our keyboard interrupt handler function in the interrupts module. So that was here, we were just looking at that. So here's our scan code. Oh, we don't need this lazy static anymore, okay. which probably means we can get rid of all these use statements. And maybe that's why they put them here originally, because they're, they're gonna disappear. Okay, so those go away. The lazy static goes away. We don't need to lock the keyboard anymore. We do get the port. We do get the scan code. And then we create a task. Oh, create task keyboard add 
scan code, scan code. And then we're going to do this part, notify end of interrupt. We don't need to print the character, right? Okay. And of course that doesn't build because I have a typo. Perfect. We removed all the keyboard handling code from this function and instead added a call to the add scan code function. The rest of the function stays the same as before. As expected, key presses are no longer printed to the screen when we run our project using cargo run now. Instead, we see the warning that the scan code queue is uninitialized for every keystroke. Ooh, let's see that. Okay. Right, look at that. Okay. So now we're going to have to figure out how to initialize it, right? Scan code stream. To initialize the scan code queue and read the scan codes from the queue in an asynchronous way, we create a new scan code stream type. Okay, we're back in keyboard. And has a private unit type. Okay. I'm not sure what that's all about. Let's put this in a separate section here. There. Uh, impl scan code stream. Oh, now we're using self. Okay. Code Q. Try in it once. For a Q U one hundred. Expect scan code stream new should only be called once, and then we panic. Self private this. Yep. And I have to spell this correctly. There we go. The purpose of the private field is to prevent construction of the struct from outside of the module. Oh, okay. That makes sense. This kind of a, uh, it feels like a little hacky. Um, but I guess it's one way to prevent having a public constructor in Rust. This makes a new function the only way to construct the type. In the function, we first try to initialize the scan code Q static. We panic if it's already initialized to ensure that only a single scan code stream instance can be created. To make the scan codes available to asynchronous tasks, the next step is to implement poll. Like met oh sorry, is to implement uh, a poll-like method that tries to pop the next scan code off the queue. While this sounds like we should implement the future trait for our type, this does not quite fit here. The problem is that the future trait only abstracts over a single asynchronous value and expects that the poll method is not called again after it returns poll ready. Our scan code Q, however, contains multiple asynchronous values, so that it is okay to keep polling it. The stream trait. Since types that yield multiple asynchronous values are common, the futures trait provides a useful abstraction for such types, the stream trait. The trait is defined like this. So it has an associated item type and poll next. So it's almost kind of like an iterator. This definition is quite similar to the future trait with the following differences. The associated type is named item instead of output. Instead of a poll method that returns poll self item, the stream tape delivers a poll next method that returns a poll option self item. Note the additional option. Yeah, so a little little iterator like <clears throat> there's also semantic difference the poll next can be called repeatedly until it returns poll ready none to signal that the stream is finished in this regard the method is similar to the iterator next method which also returns none after the last value implementing stream let's implement the stream trait for our scan code stream to provide the values of the scan code queue in an asynchronous way for this, we first need to add a dependency on the future's util crate, which contains a stream type. Glitchwitzmall says, 
I really like how Rust's async system is so well designed that it can even be used in these low-level contexts. really shows off the engineering effort that went into it. Epic Vlog says, did not know there are so many standard crates that support no standard. This is legitimately really cool. Yeah, so to, uh, to Glitch's point, um, this uh, Rust was designed right to be a systems programming language. So it needed to be able to support all these things. So if somebody wanted to add some feature, I'm sure that would break it. I'm sure it would, people would be up in arms or, or you know, suggesting alternative approaches that would work in this kind of an environment. <clears throat> all right, so we're going to add futures util to our cargo. equals false and then features equals alloc. This looks familiar, doesn't it? Just like the crossbeam queue. We disable the default features to make the create no standard compatible and enable the alloc feature that ma to make its allocation based types available. We will still need this later. Note that we could also add a dependency on the main futures crate, which re-exports the future util crate but this would result in a larger number of dependencies and longer compile times. Okay. Oh, dang it. I meant to do the cargo check outside. Oops. All right. Well, let's keep reading. Now we can import and implement the stream trait. All right. So that was pretty quick. So now we're going to say use core pin pin task pull cont. Okay. Pin pin. And from task, we're going to pull in poll and context. And then use futures util stream stream. And then we're going to impulse stream. For scan code stream. And scan code is always going to be u8, poll next. Self is going to be, oh, I did ampersand by. My fingers did that all by themselves. Mute context. Pull. Option U8. I wonder if it helps that U8 is a copy type already. I don't know what would what would it would take for non-copy types. Q scan code Q try get expect not initialized. There we go. Match Q pop. If it's okay, scan code poll ready sum scan code error cross beam Q pop error poll pending. Okay. It's building. We first use the once cell try get method to get a reference to the initialized scan code Q. Oh, I have to call pump. There we go. This should never fail since we initialize the Q in the new function, so we can safely use the expect method to panic if it's not initialized. Next, we use the array Q pop method to try to get the next element from the Q. If it succeeds, we return the scan code wrapped in a poll ready sum. If it fails, it means that the queue is empty. In that case, we return poll pending. Right. I guess we never return uh, poll ready none because we're always getting keyboard entries. <clears throat> uh, waker support. Okay, so here's where we're going to get to the waker. Uh, like the futures poll method, the stream poll next method requires that the asynchronous task notifies the executor when it becomes ready after a poll pending is returned. This way, the executor does not need to poll the same task again until it is notified, which greatly reduces the performance overhead of waiting tasks. Yep, that makes sense. To send this notification, there is, so it does introduce some latency, right? Whereas if you poll, 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 you're going to get it as soon as it hits. There is latency involved in getting from the waker 
to the task. So if you're okay with a little bit of latency injection to save CPU, that's great. Um, there's some instances where you want to flip it the other way around. You're, gonna, you're willing to burn the CPU to reduce latency. Uh, to send this notification, the task should extract the waker from the past context reference and store it somewhere. When the task becomes ready, it should invoke the wake method on the stored waker to notify the executor that the task should be polled again. Atomic waker. To implement the waker notification for our scan code stream, we need, to play, we need a place where we can store the waker between poll calls. We can't store it as a field in the scan code stream itself. Here because it needs to be accessible from the add scan code function, which is down here. The solution for this is to use a static variable of the atomic waker type provided by the futures util crate. Like the array queue type, this type is based on atomic instructions that can be safely stored in a static and modified concurrently. Let's use the atomic waker type to define a static waker. <clears throat> Okay, so we're in cross uh, futures util. We have task. Let's just put it here task atomic waker. And then we're going to create a static waker. Um, I guess we can just put it here at the top static waker atomic waker. Okay, for this to work, atomic waker new has to be constant, right? Oh, we don't have it. I just tried to jump to the definition and didn't like it. Maybe I... Yeah, okay. I guess we don't get it. Uh, the idea is that the poll next implementation stores the current waker in the static and the add scan code function calls the wake function on it when a new scan code is added to the queue. Storing a waker. Uh, the contract defined by poll poll next requires that the task registers a wake up for the past waker when it returns poll pending. Let's modify our poll next implementation to satisfy this requirement. Okay, so this signature doesn't change. This still stays the same. And then we have a fast path. Oops, I meant to do over here. Tonglebit, hello, how are you? Um, we're going to do fast path. Pop, then return poll ready. Some scan code. Yeah, talk a bit. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm doing well. Um, we're, we're in the last section of the last part of the last blog entry of Philip Opperman's blog. So um, mixed emotions right now. Uh, getting this done. Waker register. So we're going to register a waker each time we get a scan code. CX waker. And there's match Q pop. Okay, and then this changes here to waker. Dot take. And we do poll ready scan code. Otherwise, we do poll pending. Okay. Hogglebit says, exciting. Yeah, it's a great blog. Yeah, it's been it's been awesome. Let's fix that. Like before, we first use the once cell try get function to get a reference to the initialized scan code queue. We then optimistically try to pop from the queue and return poll ready when it succeeds. This way we can avoid the performance overhead of registering a waker when the queue is not empty. If the first call to queue pop does not succeed, the queue is potentially empty, only potentially because the interrupt handler might have filled the queue asynchronously immediately after the check. Since this race condition can occur again for the next check, we need to register the waker in the waker static before the second check. This way the wake up might happen before we return poll pending, but it's guaranteed that we get a wake up for any scan code pushed after the check. All right, so we look, if it's there, we can just do it. Otherwise we register the waker and then we look again.
After registering the waker contained in the past context through the atomic waker register function, we try popping from the queue a second time. If it now succeeds, we return poll ready. We also remove the registered waker again using the atomic waker take because a waker notification is no longer needed. In case queue pop fails for a second time, we return poll pending like before, but this time with the registered wake up. Right, we don't take it. Note that there are two ways that a wake up can happen for a task that did not return poll pending yet. One way is the mentioned race condition when the wake up happens immediately before returning poll pending. The other way is when the queue is no longer empty after registering the waker so that poll ready is returned. Since these spurious wakeups are not preventable, the executor needs to be able to handle them correctly. Waking the stored waker. To wake the stored waker, we add a call to waker wake in the add scan code function. Okay, so we do a try get. It should be initialized at this point. If we can't push the scan code, we still issue the warning. But if we were able to push the scan code, we say waker wake. The only changes that we perform, the only change that we performed is to add a call to waker wake. If the push to the scan code queue succeeds, oh, sorry, <clears throat> I missed that. The only change that we performed is to add a call to waker wake if the push to scan code call scan code queue succeeds. If a waker is registered in the waker static, this method will call the equally named wake method on it, which notifies the executor. Otherwise, the operation is a no-op, i.e. nothing happens. It's important that we call wake only after pushing to the, scan to the queue because otherwise the task might be woken too early when the queue is still empty. This can, for example, happen when using multi thread executor that starts the woken task concurrently on a different CPU core. While we don't have thread support yet, we will add it soon, and we don't want things to break then. MD Gazier 001, thank you for the follow. Keyboard task. Now that we implemented the stream trait for our scan code stream, we can use it to create an asynchronous keyboard task. All right. So I'm going to put it down here in, this is interrupt context. This is non-interrupt context. Okay. So let's just separate those. Hub async fn print key presses. Epic Clark says the follow notification is a little too loud. Okay. Um, I'm going to crank it down. Apologies for that. Toggle bit says, haha, that woke me up. Sorry, sorry again. Um, let me keyboard, equals keyboard, new layouts, US 104 key, scan code, set one, handle, control, ignore. Does this mean we ignore the control keys? While let sum, scan code, equals scan codes, next, await. MD Gazer 001 says, not the best pronunciation, but thanks. I was also implementing the executor by following this tutorial. Oh, nice. Did, did you complete the, the whole tutorial? Or are you still in the middle of this, this last section like me? If let OK sum key event, keyboard add byte, scan code. If let sum key, keyboard, Process key event. This is similar to what we had before in the other uh, in the interrupt handler, right? What's interesting is, and I don't think they're going to get into it, is how do you handle this going into uh, user land, right? Because if you're getting a, a keyboard interrupt, the key has to go somewhere. And there's typically a user process that's waiting for the key. So it's got to be able to send the key up 
into user land. And it's got to know which process is getting the key. I don't know how all that works. That's way above my pay grade. Oh, we need to add all these guys in here. Futures Util Stream uh, Stream EXT, right? And we have the PC keyboard, which we had from the last time. Set one, and then we have the create print. Oh, we got to add print. It's interesting that he only puts the the necessary changes in but then we have to do this um does this build even no okay that built the code is very similar to the code we had in our keyboard interrupt handler before we modified it in this post the only difference is that instead of reading the scan code from an io port we take it from the scan code stream for this, we first create a new scan code stream and then repeatedly use the next method provided by stream ext trait to get a future that resolves to the next element in the stream. By using the await operator on it, we asynchronously wait for the result of the future. We use while let to loop until the stream returns a none to single, signal its end. Since our poll next method never returns none, this is effectively an endless loop, so the print key presses task never finishes. Let's add the key, print key presses task to our executor in our main RS to get a working keyboard input again. Okay, so here's where we span, spawn the example task, which prints um, 42. And we're going to say keyboard print key presses. And of course, keyboard is not included, so I have to add that. There we go. Let's see. Hello world. Okay. Cargo run. Look at that. So we're running it at two. Well, we ran one task for, to print out the async number. And then we're running a continuous task, a never ending task, which is just waiting for keyboard presses. It's doing an await on the keyboard presses, right? And as soon as it gets a keyboard press, it um, prints it out and then goes back to await the next one. Very cool. Epic Blog says, who needs user land anyway? Didn't we talk about rogue OS? Boot straight into your roguelike. Yeah, we could definitely do that, right? We have enough now to be able to handle that. We can write to the screen and we can read from the keyboard. So we have everything we need to make a roguelike at this point. Um, get status, get add source and cargo, get commit, um, task based keyboard reader and printer. Neat.